May what I say and what you hear be in the name of God. Amen. Now, maybe all of you have no confusion about the Holy Spirit, uh, but I know a lot of people do. It's kind of hard to figure him out. How does he work? He seems to come upon people, and that's the way it worked in the Old Testament. He would come upon people. And there was an interesting, the, the, the language is interesting because in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells in us. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit comes upon people and then departs. And the Holy Spirit comes upon people in the Old Testament, uh, they would start to do things like prophesy. And that sort of lends itself to an image of, oh my gosh, I don't, hope he doesn't fall upon me because, you know, next thing I'll, I'll know, I'll, I'll start talking strange or acting strange. And of course, in the, in the New Testament, Like I said, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. But then there's all this stuff about spiritual gifts and what are those and how do those work? At the clergy conference a couple of weeks ago, I, for the life of me, don't know how this came up, but I was sitting with a group of clergy and one of them looked at me and said, now you don't speak in tongues, do you? Your church doesn't speak in tongues. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know if people in my congregation speak in tongues. Some of them probably do. And then I hit him with the zinger. I do. You know, like my head didn't turn around and, and I didn't, you know, all of a sudden. I wanted him to sort of have the, that effect of, oh my gosh, it's a normal person with the spirit who prays in tongues. But that's not, I don't, I don't want to, you know, necessarily talk about that in this sermon. I just want to say that we... The the Holy Spirit isn't any more mysterious than any other person of the Trinity, in my opinion. And how he works and what he does really can be boiled down to three things. And that's what I'm going to talk about, the ABC of the Holy Spirit. The first thing that the Holy Spirit does is arouse people's faith in Jesus. Jesus says that if, if the, there's a job description of the Holy Spirit, it's given by Jesus in the Gospel of John. And basically the job description is this. He's going to point to me. The Holy Spirit's going to take what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the Holy Spirit does is going to lead you to me. So we've got this image of the Holy Spirit pointing away from himself to Jesus. Now, There's another interesting aspect of the Trinity, the Father, of course, and in Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul quotes what scholars believe to be an ancient hymn, and it's a summary of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, took the form of a servant, didn't count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, and then Paul concludes it with this powerful statement. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and here's the punchline, to the glory of God the Father. So in other words, if you merely did nothing but declare Jesus as Lord, if you did nothing but pray to Jesus, you would be the Father's A-OK with that. So you've got the two other persons of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit and the Father, both pointing to Jesus. This is in the New Testament. And that's why I say that the the Holy Spirit's going to arouse our faith in Jesus Christ. And for that reason, the Spirit is needed so much in people's lives today. I know you, maybe you've read this, I've read it, and I, I believe this is true, that in, Western, in the Western world right now, in the United States, but also in Europe, I think, there's a hunger for spirituality, not necessarily Christianity, but a hunger for spirituality. And I think that in part, it's because people are discovering that all the other stuff you can fill your life with doesn't get you very far. I had a parishioner my former congregation who had a son in the military, in the army, in 
uh, Iraq at the time, and he was, I can't remember what they're called, but there's those people that uh, defused the bombs, all right, on the side of the road. And one day, uh, he came in, the father came into the sacristy and just sighed and said, life is difficult. And he's right, life is difficult. People know that life is difficult. People try to cope with that by surrounding themselves with possessions or power or prestige or whatever, and they're realizing that that doesn't get you anywhere. And so they're looking for spirituality. As Christians, we need to remember the the importance of the Holy Spirit, that we need the Holy Spirit's outpouring in our lives because we need our faith in Jesus renewed. And we need to understand that that's how other people are going to come to know Jesus. It's going to be through the Holy Spirit. We already read from John, he will glorify me because he he will take what is mine and declare it to you. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, he doesn't mean no one can say the words Jesus is Lord. I mean, the demons acknowledge that fact. But to worship Jesus as Lord comes from the Holy Spirit. To know Jesus as Lord, that comes from the Holy Spirit and only from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit arouses our faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, the Holy Spirit bestows on us power for living the way that God wants us to live, the way Jesus wants us to live. Uh, just There are examples abound, but here's just a couple. The first one from Romans. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And from Ephesians This is one of my most favorite chapters of any book in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 1 is really powerful. And in these couple of verses, Paul wrote, And I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. This is the same mighty power that rose Jesus, raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and me through the Holy Spirit. And one author put it this way, that, that the Holy Spirit has atomic bomb power, but a whole lot of us just live little firecracker lives. And that's often because, and I'm just as guilty as this, of this as anyone, is I, I try to go through life under my own power. I mean, let's face it, how does this power work? People get kind of nervous when we talk about the Spirit, the the power of the Spirit in our lives because we think of that power coming upon us in such a way that will maybe make us lose control or maybe make us become someone we're not. Uh, When I was a teenager, I used to worry that if I gave myself to the Lord and got filled with the Holy Spirit, that he'd send me out to the roughest neighborhood in Cleveland with a bullhorn and start trying to preach the gospel on a street corner. I really did believe that because I had met several people who seemed to be night and day different from who they were, not to mention my parents. My mother had a dramatic encounter with the Holy Spirit. She had never gone to church, well, I maybe a couple of times that I remembered as a child, But she was Roman Catholic, she married a Presbyterian, they went to the Episcopal Church, she was told she was going to hell, so she never went to church. And one day on my my 13th year, the Lord showed up in mom's life and told her, I don't care what church you go to, I want you to go to church. And it must have been some encounter because she went to church after that all the time. And the next thing I knew, they were dragging me along with them. And, uh, I mean, church became so central in our lives, but the the important thing that I remembered was the joy that my mother suddenly had. And then my father, too. Prior to that moment, my dad, 
for him, going to church was what you did. You just do it. And he was okay with that at one level, but he'd be the first to tell you he didn't know Jesus personally. He didn't know that there was power not only for living as God wants us to live, but power that's available for your own marriage and to love someone. You know, people today, this is a good example of how the power of the Spirit can work. People today want to believe that love is like, you know, you fall in love, you fall out of love, like you fell into a ditch or something. Like you can't control it. And at one level, that's true only to a point. I mean, everyone probably has had those moments of that sort of chemical connection with another person. And, you know, speaking as a man, I can tell you that that still happens. Now, before you go quoting me about lust, I don't lust. I admire God's creation. Right, honey? <laughs> so, the, the, so I can't control that. You know, those are hormones that are going off in my, in my body. I, I can't control that. But... I can take control of the love that I am called to have and want to have for my wife. And when, you know, everyone, if you're in marriage long enough, you get to that point where that sort of gaga moment, that gaga feeling for each other fades. And then I think where, that's where real love can take hold. But it's something you have to work at. There's a, there was a movie a couple of years ago called Fireproof. Has anyone seen it? Only one, two, three people. Oh, four people? Okay, Fireproof, star, starring, uh, what, Kirk Cameron? Is that the, uh, the name of the actor? Right. Uh, he was in Family Ties. Is that right? Fi- family, right? He was a childhood actor in Family Ties, a devout Christian now. And the story is simply a story about uh, a married couple who, whose marriage is on the rocks, he, Kirk Cameron's character is going to divorce his wife and his father talks him out of it by saying, look, I'm going to give you this project. It's called 50 Days of Love. And do what it says. Promise me you'll do what it says. And so all it was was one act of love every day for his wife. And of course, you know how the movie ends. The love comes back. The love was there. It just needed to be rekindled. And that's the way the power of the Holy Spirit works. If you pray for the Holy Spirit to fill you with love, then you sort of wait for the feeling. You might be waiting a long time. But this shouldn't surprise us because God has made it pretty clear that that's the way he works in general. He says to Abraham, just go. I'm not telling you where to go, just go, and I'll clue you in as you go. I suppose if Abraham hadn't gone, I, God would probably have found someone else, but I dare say we'd be a, a, a whole different group of people. The ten lepers come to Jesus and ask for healing, and Jesus says, well, go show yourselves to the priest, and on their way, they were healed. If you want to have, if you want to know if, whether or not you can, uh, you have a gift for praying for someone, you can't wait until you feel like you have that gift. I mean, I don't even know how that, what that might feel like. You have to start praying. And that's the way the power of the Spirit works. You have to admit that you don't have the power that you need. You have to ask for power, and then you have to act. You have to step out. And as you step out, the power comes. As you do the things that God calls us to do, He equips us to do them. So that's the power. It's enormous power, by the way. It is a life-changing power. I've seen it. I've seen it not only in my parents, but in other people as well. And in my own life, uh, my life changed on my 13th, was it my 13th birthday? It was right around that week. I also was confirmed and I received uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And just before you say, well, wait a minute, what do you mean you got the gift of the Holy Spirit? Didn't you get that at baptism? People used to say that all the time back in the 80s when the renewal movement was at its, at its height because we used language about baptism in the Holy Spirit and people would say, rightly so, 
wait a minute, don't you already have the Spirit? Well, you do, but you, can, you always need more of the Holy Spirit. People have used the leaky bucket analogy to describe why that's so. I don't like that analogy. I don't think that's what's going on. I don't think we, like, leak the Holy Spirit, which implies that if you just let it keep on leaking, eventually it would completely run out. Uh, that's not how it works. I don't know how it works. All I know is that the Bible tells us to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul wrote in Ephesians. He wrote this obscure little passage, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Greek word for filled is in the continuous present tense. Go on, be filled and go on being filled. Go on being filled. And this should come as no surprise to us, folks, because yes, you get the Holy Spirit at baptism, but you get the Holy Spirit again at confirmation. If you get married, you get the Holy Spirit again for your marriage. If you get ordained, you get the Holy Spirit again when you're ordained a deacon and again when you're ordained a priest. And whoever's going to be consecrated bishop is going to get the Holy Spirit again on them when they become bishop. So yes, you can, you can and you need more of the Holy Spirit arouses our faith in Christ, bestows us with power, and finally, the Holy Spirit will confer on you the character of Christ. At one level, that's what happens is the natural result of doing the first two, of understanding those, that as our faith is aroused, as we're given the power to live like God calls us to live, we find that our lives are changed, are transformed. God uses, when it comes to transformation, God uses three things. The Holy Spirit's one of them, but that's actually the second. The first is the Bible. God teaches us through the Bible how he wants us to change, what he wants to do in our life. Secondly, God gives us the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish the change. Now, the problem is that, again, if you're like me, you don't always follow that method, that God's, that God's method, and you try to sort of do it yourself and go under your own power, and that's when God pulls out the third way, which is problems and circumstances come up in your life. Those moments that cause people to say life is difficult. And that's when I'm driven back on my knees, I'm driven to my knees, and I go back to God Lord, I need your help. I need your power in my life. I want to become more and more like you. Help me. God's method is to tell us how to change in his word, give us the power to do it in the spirit. And if that doesn't work, he's going to use these problems. I don't think he causes them, but he'll certainly use them as a way to bring us back to him in faith. And again, this shouldn't surprise us. In Hebrews chapter 5, the writer of Hebrews wrote, even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Somehow Jesus actually grew into his relationship with his father over time. We have this image of Jesus sort of being born with it from the moment he came out of the womb. And I, I think that downplays his humanity. I think that Jesus did grow into an understanding of his relationship with his father. And by the time he entered ministry, understood very well that he was the father's son. But if he grew, how much more do we have to grow? If all the things that occurred in Jesus' life were necessary for him, what about you and me? I mean, Jesus experienced loneliness. Jesus experienced betrayal. Do we think that we're not going to have those, those experiences? Well, of course not. We are. We need to let those experiences drive us to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is not some mysterious, wispy, vague force that floats around the world or the universe and responsible for the latest fad in the church. That always happens. Oh, this new thing is going on in the church. Must be the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe, because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not some unknown person. We need to be continually filled with Him. The Spirit who arouses 
our faith in Jesus, bestows on us the power we need to become more and more like him, and the Holy Spirit confers on us the character of Jesus. Love, joy, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, and self-control. Amen.